Hi, this is Kelly Hill, technology reporter for RCR Wireless News. I'm joined today by Wade Sarver, who, won, who runs the Wade for Wireless blog about uh, wireless infrastructure safety and regulations. And uh, welcome, Wade. Hello. How are you today, Kelly? Good. Glad to have you with us. Um, so this week we had OSHA, or actually I think it was uh, um, a few days ago, we had OSHA release some new, some new t tower hoist regulations. And I'm wondering if you can maybe start us off with some of the context for, um, for when and how um, we see hoists used when it comes to the wireless infrastructure towers. Yeah, uh, hoisting, uh, well, I'll start with when hoists are used. Usually when you're doing heavy loads, top of a tower, usually higher up a tower. Uh, I, I did a blog post a while back about gin poles and hoisting, and I know they're different applications, but they, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, about gin poles, and you use a hoist on a gin pole to lift everything up, and you can also just hoist to a tower to lift things up. Well, what their directive covered is not necessarily the hoisting, the rigging, or anything like that. It's the human load when you're hauling people up and down, and they wanted to verify that people would do that, I guess, so I was trying to figure out why they did it. I know they have a purpose on there, but the purpose was really to define the safety procedures, and I was just trying to figure out if uh, they were doing it because they thought it would be a good idea to hoist people up and down, or whether they were just trying to, uh, I know I'm getting off point, sorry Kelly, <laughs> but I was just trying to figure out uh, if they, were, they wanted to give the safety practices for hoisting people up and down. But a hoist is generally used with a heavy load. It's, it was used a lot in broadcast. I don't see it as much in communications. Uh, I see capstan winches used and smaller winches, but not necessarily a large hoist or, a, uh, or some other type of winch. Okay, great. Um, and, and we should point out that this regulation um, specifically deals with the people hoisting uh, as opposed to the equipment hoisting. Um, so l let's talk a little bit about um, uh, what kind of does this constitute a particular change um, for the industry in terms of how it operates, in terms of things that need to be thought about before using a hoist? Yeah, I think what they're trying to do is make it clear that as long as everything's set up properly and the hoist is safe, that you can take a, a, a human load up and down the hoist for the purpose of saving people's, I guess, to save the energy. You know, they can actually ride the hoist up and down. The other thing I think they were trying to outline the directive is how many people to carry. You should only have one or two to at the most. And the reason they did that because years ago there was an accident where I think, uh, I'm doing it from memory, five people were on a hoist and something broke. And five people, it's a heavy load, right? You got five guys, 200 pounds, 1,000 pounds. Now granted they're probably holding up heavy loads, but guys, like when you, when you rig a load, you know, it stays still except for the wind. Who knows what these guys were doing? So with that said, I think they're just trying to outline the safe practices for taking a human load up and down the tower. I think the other thing they want to clarify is that it is okay to take a human load up and down the tower because after that accident, I think everyone's rule of thumb was, you know, no more hoisting people up and down. They can climb. And uh, I think that's the other reason they did it. Okay. Great. Um, so let's um, let's talk a little bit about the regulation and and give us a sense of what you think are the important parts for people to understand. Um, you know, obviously uh, OSHA has this posted as a PDF on their website, and uh, I'm just wondering if you can kind of give us your take on you know what are the key pieces of this and what should people make sure that they go in and read and understand. Yeah, here were my key takeaways. One, they had about and I have my notes over here. They have the uh, two-block device, which means they have a safety feature. So if the winch gives out for any reason, you have your safety block to catch the people, especially if you have a human load because, I mean, the winch doesn't slow down as it falls. It speeds up as well. So you're supposed to have your, your uh, anti-fall block there. Uh, it's an anti-two-block device. So one block doesn't catch. The second block will. That's number one. Competent person on site. To me, that's obvious, but not everyone does that. You don't want to send someone out there that runs a winch for the first time. You want an experienced crew, and if something bad happens, that's one of the first questions that OSHA is going to ask. Did you have a competent person on site? Um, another thing, know your maximum loads. And the, the one thing I read on that, and I read on a lot of other uh, sites on the Internet, is that you should have it posted in case you switch operators on the winch. And... Most people probably don't understand switching operators because they picture a two or three hour operation. 
The reality is the winch could be rigged up for two or three days because it's just a lot of work and you don't just rise it up and then it's done. You're going you're gonna to rig it, you're going to lift it, and then it's going to take hours for the guys in the tower probably to attach it to the tower. So it's not a five-second job. Even if, uh, let's say, the winch operator wants to take lunch and you bring somebody else in, you want to have the load limits posted. They need to understand what the limits are. Uh, if you're working with a gin pole, and I put, I put this in here because different rules apply for a gin pole. It's very important that you know the difference. You can't just, it's not like rigging to the leg of a tower, and you really have to understand rigging when you do it. And I think what they were trying to do is outline the differences between what you're working on with the winch and the obvious things like the competent person, the load line. Hey, the last thing I had was uh, they mentioned about the engineering hoist systems. You should know the engineering end end. That's very important too because if something goes wrong, quickly assess what the problem is. And if you have the drawings or the information right there with you, you're going to know whether it's a serious problem or whether you can just pull your guys into the tower and they can climb down or whether it's something you can fix quickly. But normally if, if something bad happens or it just stops, it quits working for whatever reason, you want to get your guys off the winch right away. That's in there as well. Okay, great. Um, now OSHA has been paying particular attention to the wireless industry since we had um, quite a few deaths earlier this year. Um, and they sent a letter in February basically saying to communication tower companies, wireless tower companies, that you really need to make sure that you're following all the safety regulations um, particularly and making sure that your subcontractors are, are following those regulations as well. Um, do you think that these new rules tie into or, or just are a follow-up on, on that kind of warning earlier this year? Yeah, I think it's a start. I, I hope it's a start. I hope they do a lot more than this because... Uh, as far as I know, there haven't been a lot of hoisting or winch issues in the past three years that I'm aware of. Maybe someone can correct me. But I think it's step one. They had to do something, so maybe this was the quickest thing they could turn out. Okay. And um, so what are the questions that remain um, and that you think are important to consider going forward as far as, um, you know, things that you would like to see OSHA resolve or things that you would like to see Nate work on as well? Well, here's what I'd like to see, both from Nate and OSHA. I would like to see them lay out what their next plan is for the directives for safety. In other words, we have a lot of climbing issues, right? We have a lot of, uh, a lot of questions about training, about experience, about mentorship, uh, about the wireless workers' safety. What I'd like to see is a timeline of what they're going to put out next. And I know, uh, I don't know about Nate, but I know OSHA is going to hate that because they hate deadlines, right? I mean, who likes a deadline? If, if they say, well, now we have to come out with something by the end of October, then they feel a lot of stress and pressure to come out with something by the end of October. And ask the FCC, they're changing their deadlines all the time. I mean, you know, it's a lot of stress on those guys, too, and, and they miss them all the time. What do you do? You say, all right, it'll be the end of November, the end of December. But I would like to see what their plan is for the next directives because we really need more than, than what they put out here. What they put out here, I have mixed feelings. It's a step in the right direction but is it what we needed at this time? Does it really identify the problems that we've seen in the last three years? And I bring that up because we, I know OSHA is looking into the problems, all the deaths, you know, it's just horrible. You know, 14, or 13 last year, eight this year, it's just terrible. And I just can't figure out how they're addressing the big picture. I know how they address each one. They go in, they investigate, you know, they issue fines. I think, what was it, SNS Communications just got two fines. I just would like to see what their plan is to address all the problems we've had over the last two years. And that's what I'm looking for. And even Nate. Uh, Nate's working on a lot of directives. I don't know how much is public. I wish he would make more public. And for two reasons. If OSHA and Nate made it public, I know I'm long-winded. Sorry, Kelly. Oh, let's keep going. That's great. Okay. So if OSHA and Nate made the directives public and put dates on it, it would seem real to the industry. And I think it would put pressure on them to get something out. And the reason I think that's a good thing is because if they get something out, the wireless worker in general, you know, the climbers, the tower workers, anybody, they feel like something positive is being done. They see that the action is being taken. Whereas right now, a lot of people feel like it's in limbo. That's my opinion. Okay. Great. Well, we've been talking with Wade Sarver, who runs Wade4Wireless.com. Wade, thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Ah, great. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it.